Nutrients are always cycling through our world, through the atmosphere, through the rhizosphere, lithosphere. Those last two are the rhizosphere is the root zone, the lithosphere is the non-organic geological material that's underlying all the soils. Nutrients are cycling through um, the aquatic systems too, lakes, rivers, oceans, and um, the main point here is that nutrients are meant to be utilized and held in the bodies of organisms or in abiotic rocks and minerals, and oceans, atmosphere. They are held for a while, then they move on. They cycle around through living things into non-living things and back again. Probably some of the times nutrients are held the longest are in um, geological um, rocks and minerals, and they're, they stay there for a long time and they're weathered, until they're weathered down again and released. But they cycle, they move. Um, and that's something that humans are having to reckon with, the fact that um, our systems tend to um, try to oppose these cycling systems. For example, in landscaping, um, you know, instead of keeping all the nutrients that are in our soil and on our um, property and letting them cycle through that property, we often will remove them, take them away, like in green waste. We allow, allow erosion, erosion to happen. Water comes to the site, often doesn't stay there. Um, we've uh, usually overused our soils and we're not caring for them in a way that allows the water to sink in. It usually runs off or we have a lot more runoff, which causes more erosion. So some of this is a natural process. Erosion is natural um, and growth and death of organisms is natural, but when we want to take care of things more sustainably, we want to move towards creating systems, even small systems around our homes, where the nutrients um, cycle. They stay there and they move through the plants, the animals, and the soil, and the atmosphere, and they keep going around and around because um, that's how um, our operating system of the earth is meant to function. So one of the ones we're going to look over, water cycle, carbon cycle, oxygen cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and sulfur cycle. Of course, there's many, many, many other elements, and they cycle too, but these are the main ones, especially the main ones reflecting the, um, the needs of plants and um, what's happening with the major nutrients and elements in the soil. All right, let's go on. So I'll show you a series of these diagrams that showing, shows you the nutrient or element cycle, in this case, the, the molecule water and how it cycles through the atmosphere. Um, try to get the overall feel of where it, how it's moving and the places it's stored and the places it, where it goes into living organisms and then the places where it leaves those organisms and goes into the abiotic environment too. Um, I mean, every single little detail in all these diagrams is probably not necessary to know, but definitely know the major comings and goings of water. So as you already know, you're probably very familiar with this one. There's nothing horribly new, um, except a few things. Um, knowing that water is stored in the oceans for a long time um, with a lot of nutrients. Um, you've learned about evapotranspiration, where water leaves the surfaces of the earth and even water evaporations happening off the surfaces of plants and the soil and buildings and animals and um, also off of lakes and rivers in the ocean. But transpiration is happening from inside the plants coming to the atmosphere. And together those things, evaporation and transpiration, equal evapotranspiration. That's a major uh, movement of water out of the biosphere, out of the, the, the land and animals and water bodies and into the atmosphere, where it can form clouds and condense back into water droplets, which re return to the earth or as snow also, something that's a little less known is um, the groundwater. So water can infiltrate once the precipitation hits the earth again, and it can um, infiltrate into the groundwater that's not super deep. It's not stored, but it is groundwater, and that's um, a lot of it's still accessible to, to plants and animals, and it surfaces in creeks and rivers um, often, and um, deeper infiltration goes to long-term groundwater storage that can stay underneath the ground in aquifers for thousands of years. So I think that pretty much sums it up. This one's pretty simple. 
Here's a lot of um, text to describe a little bit more about that last slide that you saw. The water cycle is also known as the hydrologic cycle. It's just the movement of water above and below the surface of the earth. Water moves from one, um, what would we call a reservoir, a place where it's gathered, um, to another through, through the system, through the processes of evaporation, condensation, precipitation, infiltration, which is water infiltrating down into the soil, and surface runoff, um, where water hits the, the land and for some reason it doesn't infiltrate. It can flow across the land um, going down slope, <clears throat> and if it gets a fast enough, going fast enough, it'll pick up some erosive capacity and carry nutrients and sediments with it. And then there's also subsurface flow, where water does infiltrate, then moves underground. Sometimes it moves, um, you know, along the contour of the land, as you would see it, like down slope, what you're seeing above the soil. Um, but sometimes it moves in a counterintuitive way. It moves against the slope of the land that you see from above. And that's just related to the geologic layers. One thing to remember about the water cycle, and it may be an obvious point, is there's really not too much water that's new that's made. You know, we have a, a we have a certain amount of water on Earth, and it changes its form between liquid, solid, vapor, and it cycles through these different forms in different places, and it's stored longer areas in some places, like in the oceans, and shorter areas, like as water vapor in the atmosphere. But we don't really gain any new water, and we don't lose water. So it's something to think about when we have water that comes to our site, our piece of land or our landscape, we want to um, try to gather it, capture it, have good rich soil that allows the water to infiltrate and feed our plants um, and not run off of our site and cause erosion and lose the water. Because you know, if, if there's rain coming, even through our sprinkler systems or our drip systems, we want to have that water stay on site. We don't want it to run off. Um, and um, we want it to move through the system naturally, but we also don't want it to leave our system unnaturally. As I said earlier, human setup, our infrastructures are kind of created to, if water hits our site to get it, not, not our irrigation systems, but like our stormwater systems and um, gutters and um, stormwater sewers, that they, they, they make water, when it hits our site, flow as fast as possible away from our buildings and our communities and out to the creeks and rivers and out to the ocean. So get it away from us because it, we don't want it to flood, which is understandable, but it's a little bit overdone. Well, well, we, we're crying at times, you know, here in Southern California, we cry drought and we do have drought to some degree, but we also are not utilizing the water that we do have. So it's kind of a water management issue more than it is a true drought. So those are some things to think about with the water cycle. Carbon cycle is also fairly simple. You know, there's CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, plants take in that CO2, they absorb it, and they use the carbon there to make their sugars from. And then when the um, biomass of the plants, the plants' bodies, the vegetation falls to the ground or their roots die, that biomass and that organic matter goes into the soil where organisms um, decompose those sugars, things like cellulose, that makes up the body of most plants and especially their roots. Um, and then it goes into the bodies of perhaps the um, soil organisms and they undergo respiration where they use oxygen to break those sugars apart and they release CO2 back into the atmosphere. That's the main cycle we're thinking about with landscaping. Um, and that's what you're seeing with those little red arrows, the red arrow that goes into the tree where it says soils and then Ultimately, the organic matter from those plants gets um, decomposed by bacteria, which release the CO2 back into the atmosphere. Um, oceans, too. CO2 can dissolve into the ocean, and it can be released from the ocean, too. There's that cycle there. Um, and there's dissolved organic carbon inside the oceans, and some of it can go become deep sediments inside the ocean, and some of that carbon dioxide can slowly be released, too. And there's also fossil fuel um, carbon dioxide emissions too. When they're burned, of course, CO2, the, the fossil fuels 
are combusted, you get the CO2 that is released from those fossil fuels. The carbon that was bound up in those fossil fuel molecules gets released as CO2 and back into the atmosphere. So that's also a fairly simple um, cycle. But the, again, we're, we're looking at, I'm, I want to present all of these cycles through the lens of um, understanding how the natural cycles exist and how humans have inserted themselves into the cycle in a way that may uh, be a little bit artificial. So for example, fossil fuels here, that was not a, an addition of CO2 into the atmosphere 150 years ago, and now it is. So there's extra CO2 that's being added by combustion of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. So looking at how we can kind of move towards these cycles being more balanced again, rather than imbalanced as they are with the atmosphere at this point. And here's some of the text that goes along with that carbon cycle diagram. Um, as you all know, carbon is the main component of organisms. So it's important for it to move through the system. Um, it's also a major component of lots of minerals, including things like limestone. That's a place where it gets held onto for a long time. But again, we want the carbon to move through its cycle. We want it to stay balanced. And um, the carbon sinks in the land and ocean. So this carbon sinks means where it's stored for a long period of time. And it, carbon is stored in the oceans for a long period of time and it's also in limestone. Um, so um, we want to um, have the understanding that the carbon is stored there, but it doesn't stay there forever. And it's still open and available to other organisms at some point. Also the oxygen cycle. Oxygen obviously is important to a number of aspects of our biosphere. The oxygen cycle is just the circulation of the oxygen through its various forms through the natural world. Um, it's free as O2 in the air, dissolved as oxygen inside aquatic systems. Um, it's uh, very abundant um, in our biosphere and in the, it's very abundant in the atmosphere as well. Plants and animals, they use it for respiration and when they're done, they return that um, air and water into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So this one, this oxygen cycle is closely linked to the carbon cycle as well. Nitrogen is in um, our biosphere. The major reservoir of it is in the atmosphere as nitrogen gas. Although plants can't take in nitrogen gas as their source of nitrogen. Remember, nitrogen is really important to all living organisms. It's part of, of proteins that builds the bodies of all organisms and their DNA. But plants can't get to it just straight from the atmosphere. It has to go through a couple of other processes to become a form that plants can absorb through their roots. Those two compounds that plants can absorb are ammonium, NH4+, plus, or nitrate, NO3-. minus. So one way plants can get the nitrogen from the atmosphere is they, some plants, leguminous plants, like uh, plants in the bean and pea family, they have nitrogen fixing bacteria that live on their roots. And those bacteria can absorb, take in the nitrogen gas from the air pockets in the soil, change it into a form that is available to the plant and the plant can take it in. And there are also bacteria in the soil that can change um, the nitrogen form from organic matter that's in the soil and break it down into a form, nitrate or ammonium, that can be absorbed by the plant. Let me show you another diagram. I find this next one to be more helpful in understanding this cycle. This isn't quite as cute and pretty as the last one, but um, it seems more straightforward to me. So let's look in the upper right. Atmospheric nitrogen, nitrogen gas, goes into the soil. It can, goes down through those open pores. You need air in the soil. So good soil will have um, some of that nitrogen gas, which is um, the atmosphere contains 79% nitrogen gas, a lot more than oxygen. So if that air gets down into the soil, you've got nitrogen gas N2 inside the soil. Um, through the process of um, 
bacteria breaking down soil organic matter, and they go, um, some bacteria will do this ammonification process, turn organic matter into ammonium, NH4 plus, and um, that can be go on. If you follow that where it says ammonium, and you go straight down on the blue line and then to the left and then up, it can be absorbed by a plant. So ammonium dissolves into water and that can be absorbed by the plant as a nitrogen source. Also, the ammonium can be converted by nitrification or nitrifying bacteria. That's that purple arrow that goes down from ammonium to the left over to nitrate. And then nitrate can be absorbed by a plant. Nitrate can also um, be further immobilized or utilized by soil organisms. And that's that purple arrow that moves from nitrate up to the, to the right back into organic matter. It can be used by uh, a plant or it can be used by an organism and be locked up again for a little while in the body of an organism. So back up to our atmospheric nitrogen, that yellow circle, some of it goes into the soil. You've got N2 gas in the soil. Some of it can be used by um, the nitrogen fixing bacteria and become part of the plant. Um, you have droppings with the newer on the soil that's creating organic matter that can go through the ammonification process and go turn into ammonium or nitrate that can both be absorbed by a plant. Go now down to where it says nitrate. That can also be changed through bacteria that do denitrification. So they take that nitrate um, molecule and they break it apart and it be, can be broken back down into, if you follow the blue arrow from nitrate to the left, then up it can go back into as nitrogen gas into the atmosphere or nitrous oxide, N2O. So that's uh, the basic cycling of nitrogen that relates to plants especially and super important for plants and living organisms. Remember the only two forms of nitrogen that can be taken up by a plant are nitrate or ammonium. So it, the bacteria are the ones that are making the nitrogen that's in the organic matter available to the plant by transforming it or changing it into one of those two forms. This slide and the next are just the text that goes along with the last two slides. I've already said that verbally and you can read it here in written form if you like to. So let's look again at the ways nitrogen cycles through our biosphere. Um, and again, biosphere means um, everywhere on this planet where there are living organisms where they're used. So it includes the atmosphere, the oceans, the soils, down pretty deep, all of that. So four processes that uh, are really the things that are describing the way nitrogen is moving Night is nitrogen fixation, and um, there are three types of that. And then there's also decay, nitrification, and denitrification. And microorganisms are the ones responsible for the cycling of nitrogen in all of these four processes. So under the first of those four types of nitrogen cycling is nitrogen fixation, and there's three types of that. There's atmospheric fixation, of nitrogen. So you've got nitrogen gas in the atmosphere and when lightning happens, it changes its form. It can turn it into ammonia. Um, just the lightning, the electricity changing the nitrogen gas, change the elements, and it'll come down as ammonia in the water, in the rain, and then it will be ammonia in the soil. Also, um, and ammonia is, is easily changed into ammon ammonium by bacteria and just chemically in the soil, and then the ammonium can be uptaken. Um, biological fixation, certain microbes, talked about that with the um, nitrogen fixing bacteria that um, live on plant roots. They can take the nitrogen gas and change it into ammonium as well. Um, and then industrial fixation. So that's when um, we have fossil fuels being um, used to create fertilizers and that fixes the nitrogen into a form that plants can absorb. Again, the process of nitrogen fixation by atmospheric fixation is a little more uh, detailed here. About five to 8% of the total nitrogen fixed 
meaning taken out of gaseous form of the atmosphere and put into living biomass, is done through this process. An industrial fixation of nitrogen, making fertilizers, and it can be processed into a form called urea um, and ammonium nitrate that when you add them to the soil, they become um, molecules that the plant can absorb. Last of the three types of nitrogen fixation is biological fixation. That's done with the bacteria. Certain bacteria can, can do that. The ones that live in a symbiotic relationship with plants, like legumes, soybeans and alfalfa are huge crops that are in the legume family, which do this fixation, which add nitrogen to the soil. There are some plants that are not in the legume family that, um, that also do nitrogen fixation. Some of our native plants around Southern California here a lot of the ceanothus and alders do that. Um, and then nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, um, the main fertility of semi-aquatic environments is due to them fixing the nitrogen gas into a form usable by these organisms. And um, those are some of the details of how it works. The first stable product of nitrogen fixation by biological fixation is ammonia. And then that's quickly converted in, um, it's uptaken by plants as ammonium. Um, it changes into ammonium in the soil, and then it can be converted and put into proteins and other organic nitrogen compounds. Okay, so that talked about the, la the last three slides about the three forms of nitrogen fixation. So let's look at the other nitrogen cycle processes. Um, number two was decay. Um, plants make protein. Um, they pass through the food web just like carbohydrates and that at each trophic level the proteins are metabolized by another organism and then those nitrogen compounds can return to the environment as, you know, excretion um, and the microorganisms are the ones that benefit from that. They're the ones that break down that manure and can utilize the nitrogen there. And they break down the molecules in manure and, you know, animal and it doesn't even have to be animal. It can be all kinds of different organisms, even microbes, have excretions. Excretions is like a big word, you know, that covers the stuff that comes out of um, all organisms as waste. They include like human waste, but it could be um, bacterial secretions, waste, anything. Um, a lot of it is broken down into ammonium. And that's something plants can really utilize. So that's what's good. Nitrification, um, the ammonium that's taken up by plants is goes of course usually through their roots and nitrate is also absorbed um, but there are certain bacteria in the soil that have to um, create the pro the thing that can be taken up by the plant the ammonium or the nitrate in the case of nitrate nitrates produced from ammonia by the nitrifying bacteria so as i said ammonia um, is um, in the soil and it's converted through um, the lightning hitting the atmosphere and making ammonia and it's also produced from bacterial decay of organic matter. And then um, the nitrifying bacteria, um, like the nitrosomas and nitrobacters, they're the ones that can um, change NH3, the ammonia, into nitrites, the nitrosomas do. And then the um, nitrobacters are the ones in that genus that can oxidize those nitrites and make it into nitrate, which the plant can absorb. There are other microbes too that convert the ammonia to nitrites. Um, um, the Crena archaeota, and they're abundant in the ocean and the soil. And then, like I said, legumes that perform the nitrification as well, converting some of their organic nitrogen to nitrites and then nitrates. And that's when plants can absorb them. And the fourth of the nitrogen cycle processes, denitrification. And those, all those other three processes that were previously mentioned remove nitrogen from the atmosphere and pass it through the ecosystems. In some ways, they remove it from the non-living part of the world and put it into the living organism, organismal part of the world. Denitrification kind of goes back, taking it from the organic matter or the plants or the organisms and puts it back into nitrogen gas and replenishes it in the atmosphere. And the bacteria are the ones that are doing this too, the ones living deep in the soil or in aquatic sediments are changing it or denitrifying these um, nitrate and nitrogen compounds and making them back into nitrogen gas. They close the nitrogen cycle loop. 
something to consider, which I touched on at the beginning of this lecture, is just thinking about how humans um, have become more and more a part of these nutrient cycles, and we could say they are more a bigger player in these cycles, and in some cases they've um, created imbalances in these cycles. So let's think about this question. Are the denitrifiers keeping up? All those bacteria that change these organic compounds back into nitrogen gas, are, is that um, happening or are we um, getting, are we depleting our nitrogen in the atmosphere more and more and more and the denitrifiers aren't keeping up by replenishing it? Um, agriculture is responsible for about one half of the nitrogen fixation on earth um, through fertilizer use produced by industrial fixation. Um, the growing of legumes and soybeans and alfalfa is also influential there. So it's a lot, we have so many, um, so much of our land now is devoted to human food production and um, we've added tons of nitrogen in the form of these in synthetic fertilizers that come from fossil fuels. So there's nitrogen that wasn't in our biosphere taken from these deep underground reservoirs of oil and some of it used to make fertilizers. So we're, along with CO2 we're adding from these deep underground fossil fuel reservoirs, we're also adding nitrogen too. So we are changing you know, the quantities that were in uh, nitrogen that were in these cycles. So are the denitrifiers keeping up with our nitrogen cycle in balance where well, we add all this extra nitrogen? Some scientists say probably not. There are examples of nitrogen enrichment, like too much nitrogen for an ecosystem to be able to handle and be resilient with in many situations. Um, algal blooms in lakes and rivers, we have too much nitrogen fertilizer, leaches out from soils of farms nearby, and you get um, big growth of algae. Um, and that can cause a problem. It can use up all the oxygen inside the water of those waterways, and then the uh, organisms like fish, they die. They don't have enough dissolved oxygen. And that's called eutrophication, that whole process. So. Um, the nitrogen cycle is also pretty clearly being disrupted because of the number of humans and the um, amount of nitrogen we're adding to the atmosphere and soil. Enough doom and gloom. Um, let's talk about just nitrogen as a um, soil um, element. Clay minerals in soils can hold ammonium ions because remember clay has negative charges on it and ammonium is positive but it can hold them too tightly if there's too much clay and get trapped in the crystal structures of the clay. Um, clay normally has low cation exchange capacity for ions like ammonium and potassium because of this, because of kind of how they physically get trapped in there. Nitrification occurs rapidly where there's a lot of calcium and magnesium ions. So that's needed for nitrification to happen, which allows the nitrogen forms to be put into a form a plant can take so you need calcium and magnesium around to help with the nitrification process because those bacteria that do, the, the nitrifying bacteria need those, um, those vitamins, the calcium and magnesium. So a broad spectrum fertilizer would be helpful to support the organisms that are breaking down the organic matter and providing you know, just straight elements in your fertilizer the plant can uptake too. It is good to note that nitrifying bacteria are sensitive to pesticides at high rates. So the pesticides aren't just kind of adding something that's foreign and poisonous to some organisms. They're also um, disrupting and changing the populations um, of these bacteria that are important for making nitrogen into a form plants can take up. So of course, if you think about it a little more, Nitrogen availability is important for plant growth. Plant growth requires carbon dioxide. So another way that the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle are linked through plant growth. As plants get more nitrogen, they grow faster, they use more carbon dioxide, they take it more out of the atmosphere and they put it into their bodies. If nitrogen is limiting, then the amount of carbon dioxide plants can absorb is limited, which would affect the climate. If we, you know, if it's at a, a high enough scale, and that's something to think about too. So both are intertwined and both need to be thought about for the health of the overall biosphere. The phosphorus cycle includes mostly just 
um, aquatic systems and terrestrial or land. Since phosphorus is very rarely a uh, gas on Earth due to um, our different temperatures we have here and pressures related in our atmosphere, it, the conditions aren't right for phosphorus <clears throat> to form something that would be in the atmosphere, a gas. So it, our phosphorus cycle is limited to water and land. So the cycle um, of phosphorus is um, goes through plants. Of course, uh, phosphorus is important for organisms, um, for the building blocks of their bodies. Um, it's also um, washed off of soils um, and goes into the marine systems or aquatic systems, ultimately landing in the marine systems and dissolving and falling down as sediments when marine organisms and plants die off too. And um, in the long-term geological cycles, it will form phosphate rocks, which then become exposed at some point, possibly in the future, and are weathered to create more phosphorus in the soil. So typically California soils have plenty of um, or adequate phosphorus to support our plants, and you don't really need to add more, although sometimes people will add more because phosphorus is important in flower and fruit and root formation and plants, so you'll see it in a fertilizer. Sulfur is a very important element um, in the formation of proteins and other molecules in living organisms. Um, it's the 10th most abundant element in the whole universe. If you've ever seen sulfur, like at Sulfur Hot Springs, um, it can be yellow um, brittle, um, tasteless, and odorless, but if you are smelling sulfur gases, those would definitely have an odor. But it, um, it's important for organisms, playing a major part in vitamins, proteins, hormones, lots of different molecules in living organisms. And a lot of the sulfur is stored underground in rocks and minerals, including as sulfate salts that are buried deep within ocean sediments. Let's talk about the sulfur cycle in relationship to land, plants on land. So the cycle begins with rocks weathering that have sulfur in them and releasing stored sulfur. Then the sulfur comes into contact with air where it can be converted into sulfate. Um, it's a, an anion, a negatively charged ion. The sulfate can be taken up directly by plants and microorganisms. And then when animals eat the plants, they get the sulfur themselves. And, and when the animals or even plants die and decompose, some of that sulfur is again released as sulfate and some enters the tissues of microorganisms. So it can cycle that way. Um, sulfur dioxide is a gas in the atmosphere um, that can be produced by um, sulfur in the soil being volatilized. Um, and then again, that sulfate, the sulfur dioxide interaction, interacting with water and in precipitation can become sulfate in the soil as well and be important for plant uptake. Um, some bacteria can take reduced sulfur in the soil and oxidize it to the form of sulfate. Some of the sulfate can be leached away. Again, it could be stored in rocks and minerals. There's atmospheric deposition of, of sulfur into the soil in the form of sulfate. And then sulfur is um, from animals and plant residues is um, re when they die or defecate, they reintroduce that sulfur back into the soil system. Sulfur also enters the ocean from the atmosphere and within the ocean, the sulfur cycles through the marine communities and the living organisms uh, moving through the food chain. Um, some of that can be emitted back into the atmosphere as um, from sea spray, that sulfur can be released from the ocean's waters and, and back into the atmosphere. And then some of the sulfur um, is lost to the ocean depths in marine sediments, the death of marine organisms that filter down to the bottom and then they stay down there in the sediments and over long, long periods of time can become sulfur-containing rocks. Sulfur is also something that can be emitted directly into the atmosphere by volcanic eruptions, breakdown of organic matter in swamps and tidal flats. That's what you smell when you smell stinky, swampy waters is the sulfur being produced. Um, or volatilizing out of there, and evaporation of water. And then eventually it settles back down with rainfall and can become sulfate back in the soil for plants. Sulfur in the atmosphere is sulfur dioxide. 
um, and it can turn into sulfate, but sulfur dioxide and sulfate aerosols absorb UV rays, creating cloud cover that cools cities and may offset global warming. Um, the actual amount of the offset, we're not really sure of. It doesn't seem to be like a big um, solution to climate change, but it could be one mitigating factor. Since the Industrial Revolution back in the later 1800s, humans have contributed lots of sulfur to the atmosphere by burning of um, coal. Um, high sulfur coal adds a lot of sulfur to the atmosphere, which creates um, basically acid rain. Um, and that's been a problem in the Midwest and the East Coast that are downwind of these coal burning facilities. One third of all sulfur that reaches the atmosphere including 90% of sulfur dioxide comes from human activities. So those activities, along with the nitrogen um, addition activities and carbon dioxide, means that we have um, significantly messed up our atmosphere, hopefully not um, irreparable. But um, acid rain forms too. The sulfate salts can, uh, that form in the atmosphere can form acid rain. The nitrous oxides can form nitrates and um, that are acidic as well. So, and the acid rain has caused a lot of damage to human structures, but natural systems as well. So we've got to be careful with that cycle too. As I said, sulfate is an anion, negatively charged, um, and it will stay um, attached to or um, attracted to the positively charged um, molecules and um, soil particles that are in the soil. And you have more positively charged um, particles of soil that are, they're more common in acidic soils. Um, so that those would be more important in that type of situation. Sulfur isn't something people worry about quite as much as um, nitrogen as far as fertilizer goes. There's a lot less chance of you having a low sulfur soil than a low nitrogen because sulfur does stick around longer. Um, but crops remove sulfur, so it can get depleted. You know, every time a plant grows, it's absorbing the nutrients and depleting them from the soil. But green mulching and manure can replenish the sulfur. Um, you can also add sulfur. Um, powder, that's usually done though, to um, reduce pH. If the pH is too high, if your soil is too alkaline, you can add sulfur powder to uh, make it more acidic. If soils are just intrinsically, habitually low, they may, you may need to add sulfur as an organic or synthetic fertilizer to um, balance them out.